The woman was luxuriating in a crisp fall day by walking around the city zoo. She sauntered around the uh, twisting paths that she knew so well, pausing first amongst the reptiles, which she, were not her favorites. But then she went on to the pachyderms, and she was always fascinated by the rhinos and the hippos with their primeval girth. The birds, well, the birds were everywhere. They were in their exhibit area. They were all around the rest of the zoo. They were even outside the zoo, and they filled her with a lightness of heart. But her favorites, her favorites by far, were the primates. She always wondered when she peered at the chimpanzees or the, or the monkeys if with their enlarged mammal brains that they were considering her at the same time. But she, she really loved the gorillas. Oh, she loved the gorillas. And on this day she was let down because uh, when she came upon the western lowland gorilla, he was asleep. She really enjoyed watching him kind of march around his pen, demonstrating that he was indeed the king of the jungle. In fact, he was the king of the zoo, but he didn't look like it today. He was, he was uh, sort of uh, on his haunches with his head leaning against the bars, and he was in, oh, in slumberous bliss. The woman wondered, was he dreaming of his ancestral home in Rwanda? <laughs> and she just stood there and contemplated him for a long time. She, she just watched him and she really didn't mind that individuals and groups were going by one after the other. The time just went on and on as she observed this, this great gorilla. She realized as she kind of uh, meditated on his beautiful uh, profile that she loved him in some way. She, she loved him. And then as the time went on, she took her hand and she reached over the barrier and into the bars and she gently stroked his cheek. And all of a sudden, a black arm came up and pinned her to the pin, pulled her over the barrier, mauled her face, mauled her arms, mauled her torso. If three zookeepers had not raced over and punctured the great beast with three tranquilizers, she would have died. Of course, she was rushed to University Hospital where she endured uh, a succession of grueling surgeries. Finally, after almost a day's worth of surgeries, she was wrapped up like a living mummy and she was sent to the intensive care unit. Her dear friend Gail had spent the night in the ICU waiting room. And when she was finally told she could go see her friend who was now awake, she did so with trepidation. She walked into the room and, oh my goodness, Gail found her friend just wrapped up from head to toe with some of the, some of the wounds were sort of seeping and, and she, she looked horrible. And so she said to her friend in the bed, she says, you, you, you must be in great pain. You must be in great pain. And all of a sudden, against all, all expectations, her friend muscled herself up on her elbows in that hospital bed and said, Pain! Pain! I'll tell you about pain. After I reached out to him, he doesn't write and he doesn't call. <laughs> Talk about looking for love in all the wrong places. And once we get beneath the dark humor of the story, we realize it's communicating to us a rather deep gospel truth. And that is, only God's love can complete us. Only God's love can complete us. And yet, and yet, we continue to give our first and foremost love 
We continue to shower our love on those things and those people who cannot possibly fill the hole that's within us. We're all guilty. We're all guilty. And that's the reason this is the gorilla in the room. Jesus tries to attend to this misdirected affection in a most really startling, if not a staggering way. He is on the winding path from Galilee up to Jerusalem. And as he makes his way, there's a veritable throng of people following him, the largest that will ever follow him, such that would make a modern rock star green with envy. And yet, he turns around on this, on this twisting path, and he does his best to get rid of most of them. Now, why, why would Jesus do that? Why would he get rid of his adoring crowd? Well, let me set the stage for us. Just before Jesus undertakes this particular leg of his journey, his ongoing journey from Galilee to Jerusalem, he enchants his public with a story. A story that would enchant most any of us because it's about a king. No, Scott, it's not about Elvis. It's... <laughs> It's about a king. And the king was going to put on a wedding banquet for his son, the prince. And he had the palace grounds decorated resplendently. He ordered a sumptuous feast be prepared such that it would put the Waldorf Astoria to shame. He had beautiful invitations written in raised gilded script. And he sent his messengers out to all the right people to come and enjoy the wedding feast and there they went out but when they came back they were hanging their heads because almost all the right people almost all the beautiful people said ah no thanks and they gave lame excuses lame shallow excuses well this incensed this incensed the king but it did not thwart him he said, okay then, okay, we're going to fill up this feast. I want you messengers to go out to the highways, byways, and hedges. Go to the outskirts of town. I want you to gather in all the people uh, from the exburbs who never get to invited to anything fancy. I want you to invite them. And I'll tell you what else. Go find the, the blind and the lame and all the folks that polite people don't want to be seen with. Ask them to come too. And sure enough, the messengers went out and here they came in streams. And when the, and when the hall was, was, was packed, the king closed the doors and he said, those first people I invited will not get one crumb of this feast. Well, it's not just a good story, it's also a prophecy. Because... Jesus has that group from all the highways and byways and hedges. All those groups are art amongst the polite people. They're thronging behind Jesus. I mean, they're in a great wave behind him. But it's then that Jesus turns around on that winding road and he looks at them and he says, whoever does not hate their mother and their father and their wife and their children and their in-laws and their very self cannot be my disciple. Lord have mercy. Why would he say that? Why would he say that? Well, the key, the key, you see, is in the wedding feast itself. The wedding feast in the Bible is always a symbol of deep communion with God. The wedding feast is always a symbol of deep communion with God. That's what Jesus is interested in. And if you don't believe me, just do a search through the Bible and you'll see. My favorite is in the waning, my, my favorite example of this is in the waning chapters of the great prophet Isaiah. I believe it's chapter 62, where God speaks through the venerable prophet. He says, 
I am going to call my people by a new name. And they shall be a crown of beauty in my hand. They will no longer be called Shamama, which means forsaken, but they will be called Beulah, which means married to me, the Lord thy God. Whoa. Now, this would rise up for me because during my entire childhood, my mother would float around whatever hovel we lived in. She would float around the house and she would sing, I got a home in Beulah land that outshines the sun. I got a home in Beulah land that outshines the sun. I got a home in Beulah land that outshines the sun. Look away beyond the blue. And I used to think she did that just to try to humor us and stave off the blues because the rent collector was always at the door. Uh, but I realize now she was trying to sing the truth of the cosmos into us. Like an aboriginal grandparent, she was trying to sing the foundational truth of our faith into each one of us four children. And that is only the love of God, only be married to the Lord will complete us. Anything else will come up empty. Yes, only, only that will complete us. In the New Testament, remember Jesus just, just hours before he is, he's taken away to be crucified, he offers up this magnificent, this heartfelt, this, this, this desperate prayer to the Father. And he says, Father, I pray that that they may be one even as you and I are one. I pray that they may be in us as I am in you and you in me. <gasps> Do you hear that? I pray that they may be yoked to you, Father. I pray that you may dwell in them, Father. I pray that you will inhabit them, Father. I pray that you will possess them. So you can fill that hole that only you, you can complete. His last prayer Imagine that. Our, our destiny is to love God beyond all. And it means we're going to have to say yes to some things. And we're going to have to say no to some other things. Well, why in the world, though, would Jesus say you got, you know, though anyone who does not hate their mother and father and brother and sister and wife and ex-in-laws twice removed uh, cannot be my disciple. Why would Jesus say that? Well, obviously it's exaggeration. I mean, Jesus would knowingly break number five of the big ten. Honor your father and mother so that your days may be long in the land. Or what is that, Exodus 20, 12? Okay, no. But what he is saying, and this is very, very pronounced, and this is extremely important for you and me to hear. The Lord is saying, even those relationships that are dearest to us, even those loves that have, that have, that have meant so much to us and mean so much to us, they cannot fill us. They cannot fill the hole that's here. You know, it is an important part of our life as adults as we begin to realize that, no, our parents couldn't give us everything we wanted, right? Yeah, all of you have come to that place, I hope. You know, I mean, nothing is more kind of abhorrent than the adult that kind of goes around and says, oh, golly, my mama didn't have enough time for me. You know, my daddy, my, my daddy just, you know, he, could, he, he just wasn't much of a dad. Okay, I get that. But guess what? Our parents cannot give us all that. They can't. Because there's a hole here that only God can fill. Right? That's true. And let me tell you something else. If you start making your children and your grandchildren and your spouse that, that love that's going to fill everything you need, you're going to live in desperation. I know. I've tried. Look, I... I love my kids, my adult kids. I love my grandkids. I adore Kay. Man, she's been my best friend since I was 11 and she was 10. But I came to this realization about a decade ago. Unless I love God more, I could never love her the way she needs to be loved. 
Because she can't feel this. She can't. My grandkids can. Only God can. And so the Lord's warning us off of that. That's all. Now, you may be wondering, okay, this sounds like a pretty, pretty tall hill to, to climb. Well, it is. I mean, um, it, that's why right after this, Jesus says, whoever does not bear their own cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Now, in the Greek, that is in graphic present tense. It would be better stated something like this. Bear your cross and follow me. There is an immediacy to what Jesus is saying. Bear your own cross and follow me. And that tells us that it is, it is a gradual revelation in our life. It doesn't happen all at once. That we begin to discipline ourselves. We begin to open ourselves so that the experience of God becomes more and more in us. It will be over a lifetime. What did Paul, the greatest apostle of all times, in the great 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians, what does he say? Uh, now I only know in part, but then I will fully understand, even as I have been fully understood. The great revelation of God happens, and not only do we begin to understand, but we realize that, my goodness, the one who understands me is within me. Has filled the hole that my grandkids and my wife and my husband and my kids couldn't fill. They're great. And, and let me just say this. We are meant to shower our love on those people that God puts in our path. There's no doubt about it. And there's not some quotient of love. It's not like you give out so much and there's none left. The more you give, the more you get. But until the Lord begins to fill us, we will not be able to love that way. Take it from a pro who's tried the other, the other way. We'll be able to love the way we should. And then, and then the Lord at the end says, he says, so listen, folks, which one of you would um, start to build a big tower but not kind of look at, see if you had the materials you needed to, to finish that tower before you started? And then he says, which one of you yahoos would wage war with your 10,000 soldiers against the guy, you know, down the block that has 20,000 soldiers? without counting the cost? And of course the answer is, well, none of us. And that's a very potent conclusion to this. The Lord is saying, this is rigorous stuff, okay? This, this opening ourselves to God is not for the faint-hearted. It is for those, it is for those who are willing to walk the long, winding road with Him. And Sometimes it's going to be tough. But there's a persistence and there's a doggedness about it. And the payoff is beyond anything we expected. You know, on this first day of Sunday school, which is an important day for me. You know, I, before I was, well, actually even after I was ordained, I coached high school football for about a decade. And um, in those days, especially in, in, in Tennessee, I remember the first day of practice and you could, and it was a little cooler if you can imagine such a place. And, um, and the fresh cut grass would greet you, would greet me and, and the fresh faced kids would show up. Hey, this season's going to be better coach. And all of us coaches would be kind of ready. We'd say, yeah, you're right. There's a sense of expectation all around. Well, that's the way I feel today on the first day of Sunday school. That's the way I feel. But let me tell you what my real dream is. My dream is not so much that we learn a million things. I want us to know about the Bible. I want us to know about our faith, about a prayer book and all that. But what I really want is this. I want us to sing the deep truth of the cosmos into each other's life. I want us, I want us, to, I want us to, to communicate as deeply as possible that we were made to be married to the Lord who made everything. And I want us to be persistent and I want us to be serious about that because I am quite certain there is 
a gorilla hanging around this room. Please stand.